Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me on episode 10 of the show about the show. Hey, look at that. I made it 10 episodes and nobody canceled me yet. All right. Well, today we have a cool episode. I have a former major league coach with the Minnesota Twins. This man has spent nearly over 30 years in the game, 20 years as a coach for the Twins, Scott Alger. He will he is coming on here shortly to join us. And then the other really cool thing is, the other really cool guest that we have on is Jessica Soto. She is the fiancé of Jacob Feria, who's a pitcher for the Tampa Bay Rays. So we're going to talk a little bit about their backstory, and we're going. I'm going to kind of hopefully give you guys a – look at what it's like for the wife of a major league player who has to be gone for three months a year and kind of what it's like to have to take care of everything and this and everything that goes along with being a wife. And Jessica will be on here in about a half an hour. But first I am very, very pleased to have on one of the one of my favorite uh, coaches of all time for the Minnesota Twins, Scott Alger. Scott, how you doing? Good. How you doing, Dylan? I'm doing Thanks well, thank you. Hey, thank you for coming on. So let's jump right in. You were actually, a lot of people don't know this, you were actually a player for the Twins. You got drafted in 1977 and you played 35 games in 1983. Can you talk about getting drafted by the Twins and then ending up uh, making the major leagues as a player? <laughs> well, I went to St. John's University in New York, and uh, our scout, Herb Stein, he also signed Rod Carew and Frankie Viola. He was at a game one day, and he was there watching a pitcher named Charlie Puleo that pitched for Seton Hall. And that particular day, I hit two triples off him to the opposite field, and Herbie came over to me after the game and said, hey, you interested in playing pro ball? I said, well, well, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I kind of sat out the first day of the draft, and then uh, the next day I was drafted in the 18th round, and he came to my house and signed me, and I was off to a little small town called Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin, population 5,000 in the Midwest League. Sure. That's how it all started. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Now, I, I've talked to a couple other – um, players on here, kind of who played, who played um, back in the '90s and stuff. Was it, was it, was there any hiccups for you in terms of signing, or did you kind of take the Twins' offer that they laid out? And was there any thought process as to, well, oh, maybe I want to, you know, maybe I want to do something different. Maybe I want to go back to college. Or did you know, kind of know, as soon as you got drafted, you were going to sign? Yeah, I kind of knew right away because, you know, that's what I wanted to do, uh, give it a shot, play pro ball. And, uh, you know, they didn't offer me a heck of a lot of money. They just gave me $5,000 uh, and uh, incentive bonuses if you made it to double and triple A. And uh, I, that's what I wanted to do my whole life and just play ball. And, and, you know, I grew up in New York, grew up a Yankee fan, and, uh, you know, wanted to be uh, the next Mantle or, uh, you know, some of the great players that came through there. Sure. Now you, you mentioned that you know you were drafted in, or you were drafted and you went into Cedar Rapids. Did you play with a lot of the guys that the Swins had coming up the pipeline in that time? The Herbeck, Gaetis, Brunanskis, well, those kind of guys. That, that, those guys were kind of um, a little bit behind me. I was a little older. Um, okay. Herbie was a couple years behind. Gaetti came on a little bit later. Um, I signed in 77, and the Milwaukee Brewers signed a shortstop named Paul Molitor that same year. And we went to the same league. Harold Baines was in the league. I mean, it was a fantastic league as far as A-ball. But as far as uh, the Twins players, they were a little bit later on in that group that came up, you know, the Herbecks and the uh, Gaetis and the you know, Bonanski sure. and those guys. They were a little bit later. And I did play with them in okay. 83 in the major leagues. Of course. And now, of course, I played with them in the minor leagues in double-A as well when, in uh, 1981. We won the Southern right. League Championship Let's... that year. Yeah, I Go was ahead. actually going to segue into that. Let's talk about that. You know, you guys win the win the championship in 81. Um, did you – I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of Twin fans know those early 80s teams were not good. They were really, really bad. And then, 
you know, you kind of saw the progression as to as getting closer to 87. You know, they had a winning season in 86, and they did well in 88. Can you – did you see that, that that talent was there to possibly win a World Series at oh, that yeah, time? Oh, yeah, without in a 81? doubt. Without, without yeah. a doubt. You know, you, you had a lineup down there in Orlando. You know, you had almost every guy had ended up playing in the major leagues. You had Gaetti and uh, third – Kid named Rod Booker played shortstop. T- Timmy Tuffle played uh, second base. I played first base. Uh, uh, Timmy Laudner caught. And you had in the outfield, you had Randy Bush, Andre David, and uh, a kid named Steve Douglas that probably would have played in the major leagues, but he hurt his arm. And then on, on the mound, okay. you had Frank Viola. You know, the talent, the talent was there. You know, uh, we ended right. up beating the Yankees in the in the playoffs in the Southern League. You know, they had Mattingly in that group, but you know we. We pretty much clobbered them, but yeah, it was there. You could see it. It was uh, it was going to take a while. Of course, they uh, some of them were kind of rushed up to the big leagues. Probably uh, Lardner went right from Double A that year. So did uh, Gaetti. and Randy Bush kicked around a little bit more in the minor leagues, and so did Frankie. But they all eventually got up there and, and were, were pretty good players in the major league. Absolutely. You played uh you played in nineteen eighty three, you played about thirty five games in nineteen eighty three, you played mainly at first base. Um, can you kinda of talk about you know, specifically at that time you had Kent Herbeck playing first base. Can you kinda of talk about <laughs> Herbeck as a player and then Herbeck as a as a kind of a clubhouse guy? 'Cause I've just I've heard he's just a great, great clubhouse guy. Absolutely. He's a great player. A very, very good first baseman, and obviously a good hitter too, good power. And yes, yeah. in the clubhouse he was awesome. Off the field he was awesome. Just a, a fun guy to be around. A good teammate. All those guys were at that time. You know, they didn't have any bad apples on those on those teams at all. You know, that was just uh, the way it was. You know, it was just uh, it was very good camaraderie on that team. Now, now was that the was that the Johnny Goral teams? Well, when I was there, the manager was Billy Gardner. It was Billy and, Gardner. Uh, okay. Yeah, I okay. think Billy went all the way up until maybe 86, and then Ray and Miller then it took was Ray over. Miller. And then, yeah, yeah, and then, and then TK. TK took over in 87. Sure. I think sure. TK might have took over okay. the end of 86, too. Yeah. But yeah, he was, uh, yeah. TK was my manager in the minor leagues as well, in that, that Southern League team in Orlando. Yeah, we had some good players come through there. You know, it's a credit to the organization, you know, and it, and it didn't stop there, obviously. It, they, they came through again, you know, in the early uh, 2000s. Good drafting, good, good development. Now, did, now it's, it's interesting that you talk about that because, you know, I, I've kind of seen that in the last 30 years or so um, with the Twins where they'll go through – slumps where they'll be bad for four or five, six, seven years and then they'll and then they'll win a lot of games because they have a lot of talent, but in order to get that talent they have to be, you know, usually pretty bad. You talk about the early we talked about the early eighties and then obviously eighty seven and ninety one happened. You talk about the late nineties, you guys almost nearly get contracted, move to Charlotte, North Carolina, and then you win, you know, six division titles. Do you kind of I mean, I know that I know that you're not coaching right now, but I'm sure you still follow the Twins somewhat. Do you do you kind of see the do you kind of see that trend happening again? You know, you've got a lot of we have a lot of talent. We have a you know Buxton and Dozier and Sano and guys like that, and they've unfortunately had you know a lot of losing seasons since they opened Target Field. But do you kind of see that as as you know that pattern continuing where you have to lose a lot to be able to win consecutively? Well, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you look at their team now. I mean, and it's a credit to Terry Ryan. You know, he got all those players. He signed all those players. And, you know, Gardy had one of them up earlier, but Terry uh, left him in the minor leagues to develop a little bit more. And, you know, you got uh, a legitimate shot at, at winning that division, I think, and especially the way Cleveland lost some of their bullpen and they lost Santana. And I'm a good friend of one of, their co- one of their coaches is Brad Mills, and he just left for spring training. Here he's from Visalia, where I where I live, and and he said, yeah, the, the Twins are a very very talented team, you know, and he's very concerned about them. They can do it. I mean, they need some pitching. Obviously, pitching's the name of the game. I think every team needs pitching. Even the Yankees going to have to pitch. 
you know, and then didn't help Santana going down, but I think he's only going to be out for 10 weeks, they said. But, yeah, I followed him quite a bit last year. Yeah, and and he's only supposed to miss he's only supposed to miss the first month of the season. Now you yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, you talk about you talked about um, you know, coming up with those guys and playing with them. After your playing career ended in in uh 1983, you got into coaching. Uh you were the coach of the Visalia Oaks in 88 mm-hmm. and you became California manager of the year in 1990 and you also had successful runs with the Salt Lake Buzz and Portland Beavers, which were some of my favorite uh, minor league twin teams <laughs> growing up. Can you kind of talk about that that part of your your career, kind of being a manager, and then how that kind of set you up to become a coach in terms of the teaching aspect? Well, I mean, it was a big adjustment at first. Uh, Jim Rance always told me when you quit playing, you know, g- give me a call and, and I'll, I'll find a spot for you somewhere in the minor leagues. And it turned out that he had a spot in Visalia. Usually when you start managing, you usually go to rookie ball and then low A, but I went over high A. And it was a big adjustment. You see there's a lot of kids making a lot of mistakes. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed the teaching aspect at every level. Um, you know, I just I was enjoying what I was doing, just trying to get players to the major leagues and helping out in the minor leagues. And then, you know, in 1995, TK called me and asked me to be a coach there. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll be honored to be a coach. And, but I really enjoyed uh, the minor leagues, each each level. We won uh, each level where I was at, and we ended up winning the Southern League in uh, 1991, the same year the Twins won the World Series. We won the Southern League that year. And then I went on to AAA and the Portland Beavers, obviously, and Salt Lake Buzz, and it was just a really good time. And you know, I was I was honored to be there, and uh, when he gave me the call, I was honored to be part of his staff as well. Absolutely. Now, who were some uh, players that you had on that, on those Portland Beavers, Salt Lake Buzz teams that Twin Sands might recognize? Well, let's see. Scott Stahoviak. Okay. Denny Hawking. Denny Hawking, remember him? Okay. Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, Utility guy, yep. A couple of Minnesota guys, J.T. Brewitt. Okay. Jay Kwasnick, yep. Jay Kwasnicka. Um, yep. You know, you know what? We had Mike Trombley. We had Pat Mahomes. I had okay. Willie Banks. Johnny so you Ard. had a lot of guys. So you had a lot of guys who who really made the Twins team, who made the pro, who made the big league club in the nineties. Yeah, some of them did. You know, they didn't. Some of them didn't have long careers, but you know, uh, Latroy Hawkins sure. was there. Yeah, okay. He had a long yep. career. Um, yep. Funny story that my first year managing in the California League here in Visalia, my first game was playing against the San Bernardino Spirit, which was Seattle Mariners A-ball team. And this kid walks up to the plate, uh, his third hitter in the lineup, and I had a a college pitcher pitching, had a good changeup. Threw him a changeup, he kept his hands back and dotted the top of the scoreboard. It was Ken Griffey Jr., Oh, okay. And then he next time up he bunted for a base hit, and then stole second, stole third, and then he caught a ball in left center field, threw a guy out of third. I'm going like, damn, it's like watching the major league all star in eight ball. <laughs> and sure enough, he, he he turned out to him and Kirby Puckett were the two best players that I've seen personally on the field as part of my our team. Obviously, Kirby and an opposing player was Griffey. They were the two best players that I saw. I mean, I grew up, like I said, I grew up in New York, and I saw some players come through there on TV, you know, Clemente and, and uh, Aaron and Mays and all those players. But these two players, sure. from a pers- from a personal standpoint, they were the best two players I've ever seen. When you saw Griffey doing that, did you know that he was going to be a Hall of Famer, or did you know he was oh, going to yeah. be a multi-time All Star, well, one of the best? I didn't know about. I don't know about Hall of Famer. You have to stay healthy to be a Hall of Famer, but you could tell the talent was there and the tremendous ability. I mean, just to watch a kid, he was only 18 years old at the time, and he only spent a half a season in the California League. Then he went right. up to Double A, and then he went to Big Leagues. But yeah, it was yeah, it was easy to identify a, a man with the boys per se. <laughs> Right, absolutely, absolutely. And so 1994 strike happens. Can you, as somebody who was in baseball at the time, even maybe, you know, on a minor league level, because you didn't become the Twins' first base coach until 95, can you kind of talk about from the baseball aspect, um, 
oh, what the 94, how the 94 strike affected you guys, what you heard about it, replacement players, all that kind of stuff. Can you kind of talk about that process in that season? Yeah, well, we were, I was managing in Salt Lake. And, uh, I mean, nobody thought about replacement players then. Um, they just thought about playing, you know, their season out in the minor leagues. And, and uh, actually, TK came down to, you know, uh, Salt Lake and spent like 10 days with us. And, uh, you know, not, not a lot was said about it. You know, obviously, the, all the goings on behind the, the scenes weren't talked about. So we just played our season out and, you know, went from there. And then the next year, of course, with the replacement players, that was kind of a mess. But, you know, we were kind of stuck in between. We we work for management, and yet we're part of the Players Association. Right. So it was kind of bad for us. So you get called up to the Twins in 95 as a coach. Um, you, you're the first base coach. Was that the first time you'd ever done any base coaching? Well, it's the first time I ever did first base, yeah, because in the minor leagues, first when you're a manager, you do you do third base as well as manage okay. the game. Sure. But it turned it turned out that that spring we were playing a game in Bradenton with the replacement players and Gardy, who was coaching third base, play coming to third base and their pitcher was backing up third base and collided with Gardy and Gardy tore his Achilles. So Gardy was basically oh, out that whole year. So I moved over to third base and then Jerry White got called up from the minor leagues to coach first base. And then the following sure. year, TK, TK wanted me to stay at third base, so Gardy went to first base. And I stayed at third base for another four years until Terry Crowley left, and then I became the hitting coach. Sure, sure. But, yeah, you, you, coach, you coach third base in the minor leagues when you're managing the game. It's, you know, and I did it a couple times sure. in the big leagues when, when uh, Ronnie got thrown out of the game. You know, I would still coach third base and manage the game. So. <laughs> it's kind of double yeah. hard, though, in the big leagues. You right. got to think ahead, right. and you really should be in a dugout. But yeah, right. And, you know, and you talk about that. 2002, you you managed five games while Gardy was out. You were three and two, um, and then following the 2005 season, you were shifted from first base to third base coach, which is the position you held through the 2010 season. Can you kind of? We have about. 13 minutes left. Can you kind of talk about what the difference is between coaching first base and coaching third base in terms of not only what information you have to relay to players, but what information you're getting from the manager and reading the situation and all that kind of stuff? Well, I think uh, both of the positions are a job in themselves. Um, obviously, you're a little more involved in the game when you're coaching third base because you have a, a decision on the outcome of the game. And there's a lot right. of pressure as far as making decisions. And as a third base coach, you have to take chances. You just can't sit there and hold your arms up in the air and say, stay right here. You know, you have to take chances, especially with two outs. And I did a lot of times and got guys thrown out. But, you know, you just we just try to teach them to pride themselves on getting a better jump, getting bent, making better turns and stuff like that. But I really think a good third base coach has to really take chances. And, you know, it's hard to throw guys out now, especially at home now, the way the catchers can't block the plate anymore and, and, uh, yeah, there's, there's a little more pressure, I think, at third base. But first base as well is a job in itself. And, you know, third base coach gets the sign from the manager. He's got to help the base runners out, obviously. He's got to make everybody aware of what's going on. And and uh, it's it's a big job. It really is. Absolutely. Now, did you have a preference between third base? It sounds like third base you were a little bit more active. First base you can kind of, you know, Hold hold some more equipment and maybe not be as into the game as you would be on a third base level. Did you have a preference between coaching first or third? Uh, not really. No, I didn't. Uh, I, okay. I didn't enjoy. I enjoyed. I enjoyed being on the field, either either spot. Um, yeah. You know, I, I also enjoyed being a hitting coach. You know, spending time hours and hours in the batting cage, which I used to call the laboratory. It's just. You know, you you hardly even get to see the field sometimes because you spend so much time in the batting cage. But I enjoyed sure. all aspects of it, and you know, just enjoyed being in a major league uniform and being around the fans. Now, uh, fans were great. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Talk about what it's like 
talk about what the difference is like between playing in the Metrodome versus playing at Target Field. You got to spend four seasons or almost five seasons at Target Field, and you spent a lot of years at the Metrodome. Talk about what the difference is in terms of a coach, both reading the ball and seeing the ball, and how that affects kind of you know your decision whether or not to throw a guy out, and then playing outside like at Target Field. Well, obviously the Metrodome was very good to us. Um, I can not really say a lot of bad things about the Metrodome. Obviously, the turf made the ball much faster to the outfielders, so it was more difficult to score runs on base hits. And the roof, we had problems with the roof as far as balls going up in the roof and and outfielders losing the ball. And we had as many problems as visiting teams did. I can recall one game when Joe Nathan was pitching the end of the game, and Prince Fielder hit a pop fly, high fly ball to the center field, and Lou Ford came in. He had no clue where the ball was. It bounced 20 feet behind him, and Prince, of all people, got an inside the park home run. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, it, it was very good to us. We we won some division titles there. We had a great uh, game 163 against the Detroit Tigers, where we won that game absolutely. and then went on to the playoffs. And uh, but nothing really can can compare to playing at Target Field. Beautiful, beautiful stadium. Uh, fans are great there. Great place to watch a game. Uh, the ball travels good now. And initially, it didn't travel that good, but now I think it travels fine now. Um, it's a fair park, okay. fair for pitchers and hitters, and uh, it's just nice to be outside. It's a little chilly in the, in the springtime and maybe late in the season if you're in the playoffs, but other right. than that, it's great. Minnesota's great in the summertime. When was the last time you were at a game in Target Field? 2014. 2014. Okay, so you have yeah. you haven't been back since then, huh? No, no. I'm okay. I'm kind of on. Okay. I'm kind of on a shut shut down right now. My wife's having some health issues, so okay. I, you know, I had a, uh, an opportunity to maybe go with Guardy as as a coach with the Tigers, and and uh, I had to basically tell him. Uh, he said he was going to fight like hell for me to be a coach, and I said, you know what, Guardy, I, I'm honored that you think of me, and it would be a great challenge, but. I got a challenge here myself with my wife right now. She's going through some health issues, so I had to basically say no. Sure. Well, I think, you know, all twin fans, you know, you know, the the saying is once a twin, always a twin. And I think, you know, once you, uh, you know, I think we all hope that your wife, your wife gets better and improves. Can you, can you tell me and talk to the fans about, you know, obviously you, you coached for two different managers. You coached for TK and you coached for Gardy. What were they? How were they alike, and how were they similar? Well, uh, both very attentive to detail. Very attentive to detail. Nothing got by them both. Um, both liked to have fun. Uh, Guardy was probably a little more of a practical joker. Um, both ran the clubhouse is great. Um, I think Tommy might have been a little bit more difficult with the media. From <laughs> Uh, sure. my aspect of it but uh but they were both great managers and both uh you know complete managers basically you know that's what you want out of a manager a guy that can handle a clubhouse run the game on the field run the pitching staff handle the media and deal with the fans and they all did that they Absolutely. both did that and they were i thought they were both great managers really and got, uh, detroit's got the right guy over there right now to to kind of combine the uh new school and old school i think it's cardi's going to do that really good over there Absolutely. I had a, I had a former player for the Twins on last night, Michael Ryan. And I asked him <laughs> Michael to give Ryan. me a wrong instant, instant I had offense. Ryan, yeah, I had he told he told the story about his major league debut that didn't count be, and uh he got two hits and two RBIs and scored twice in the first inning in a game and you guys put up a nine spot and the rain came in the third inning the Hall of Fame wanted yep. all his stuff, and and uh, it was against Detroit, and the game didn't count. But, uh, yeah, I had <laughs> Michael Ryan on last night, and I asked him for a Gardy story, and he said uh, he told a story about a time that Gardy, Gardy was arguing balls and strikes, and he went out to the umpire, and he was just calling him every name up and down, trying to get thrown out of the game, and Gardy told him, I'm not, I'm not leaving the field until you throw me out of the game, and the ump just wouldn't do it and wouldn't do it. 
And Gardy finally told the umpire, he said, all right, look, I, he's like, there's this game on that I want to watch starting in three minutes. I need you to throw me out of the game. And the ump finally <laughs> tossed him. Can you give me a Ron Gard? Can you give me a Gardy story? Yeah. For, uh, and then a Kirby Puckett story to wrap this up. All right. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, Gardy was a pretty good practical joker. And he had a lot of, uh, he had a shocking can that you'd pick up the can and would shock you. And he had a okay. shocking pen, and uh, he got David Ortiz lunch times. One day he got David Ortiz twice with the shocking can. So when David <laughs> got traded or got let go and went over to Boston, he told Gardy, Gardy, you will never get me again. As long as I'm in the big leagues and you're a manager, you will never get me again. So Gardy said, all right, that's cool. So a couple of years later, we're in Fort Myers, and, and we're playing the Red Sox, and David's out in left field in, during batting practice. And we're hiding in the tunnel in the dugout. We send the bat boy out with a ball with a pen that actually, when you open it, it kind of pops like a, a firecracker. <laughs> and the bat boy goes out to David in left field and says, uh, David, uh, Eddie Guadardo wants you to sign this ball for him. And David goes to pop, open the pen, and it pops in his face. And he's looking around, and we're laughing in the dugout. And he looks at us, and he points up in the air. He goes, oh, you got me again. <laughs> But anyway, that's what the Gardy was all about, having fun, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and, and Kirby, Puck, Kirby Puckett, let's see. Well, I played with Kirby in the minor leagues, and uh, we were in Old Orchard Beach, Maine. We played a Sunday afternoon game, and Puck went 0 for 5, and he had four strikeouts against a, a pitcher that ended up pitching the big league named Steve Farr. He had a good breaking ball. So that night, Puck called me up and says, come down to the bar. I'm going to big leagues the next day. I went, shit. I hung up the phone. I said, he's not ready for the big leagues. He's hitting at about 260 at the time. Go down to the bar, have whatever. He buys everybody beers. And and basically the next day, flies all the way out to Anaheim, gets to Anaheim, doesn't have any money because he bought everybody beers. <laughs> and he had to pay the cabbie. <laughs> so he had to go in the, in the clubhouse and get money for the cabbie. Billy Gardner's got him in the lineup, leading off. He goes four for five first game. <laughs> so much for my ability to judge talent. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, now this podcast, obviously, too, is, is about family. Can you kind of spend – got about two minutes left. Can you kind of talk to me about your family? And you said you had your wife dealing with some stuff, but uh, can you kind of talk to me about your family and just give kind of listeners a little idea of the Alger family? Well, all my family is in New York, my immediate family, my brothers and sisters. My mom and dad have passed away. Um, they're all part of Long Island, New York. And uh, I had a – my sister's daughter was an All-American basketball player at Ohio State. It, she played in the WNBA a little bit, Samantha Perhalis. And my daughter it lives in San Diego. Uh, they own their own uh, event planning business, her and her husband. And she's actually in Vietnam right now on a vacation, a three-week vacation in Vietnam. And wow. we have a nice place to go visit, San Diego. It's really beautiful down there, obviously. And we're only five hours away up here in Visalia. I still live in Visalia. That's where I actually met my wife out here in 1978 when I played out here. And the funny story okay. is we have a 40-year reunion of that team this summer here at the local ballpark. It's the last championship team Visalia ever had. The 1978 Visalia Oaks, which was an A-ball team of the Minnesota Twins. Okay. It's a 40-year reunion this summer. And it's like he, they got like wow. 18 players coming back. It's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. Very much. Excellent. Well, Scott, I appreciate it. We have under a minute left here. Um, I just want to thank you for being willing to come on the podcast and kind of talk about uh, – your your career and being a coach and sharing those uh sharing all that stuff with us and i hope to uh have you on the podcast again going forward all right well like i said thanks for having me and then i'm kind of boring right now but uh if you ever need anything <laughs> just let me know <laughs> i will do that thanks scott i appreciate it take care all right take care see you then. yep bye all right well that was former Twins player for 35 games and former Twins coach for over 20 years, Scott Alger. What a great guy. What a, 
you can tell he's been around a lot of baseball, just listening to the stories that he has to share. You can tell he's a real, he's very, very knowledgeable about the game of baseball. You can really, you really kind of tell that from, from everything that he talked about. And, and what a 40, what a 40 year reunion that's going to be. 1978 Vesalia team. So my second guest coming on, I'm very excited about. Her name is Jessica Soto. She is the fiance of Tampa Bay Rays player Jacob Faria. We're going to we're going to kind of switch gears here, and we're going to talk about the life of a baseball wife. It's it's you know I think when a lot of fans watch games they don't maybe necessarily uh, you know take into account the the aspect that there is usually a, a a rock solid woman at home taking care of the things or working hard or whatever the case may be so we're gonna bring her in and we're gonna talk about that with her ladies and gentlemen Jessica Soto how you doing Jessica Hey guys what's up Hey doing well doing well thanks for coming on so. You are engaged to Jacob Faria. Can you talk about first of all, talk about how you guys met and got engaged, and then what was your uh, how, how did he tell? Did you know that he was a major league baseball player or prospect when you met? And if not, how did he tell you? Um, actually, we met in high school, so he definitely wasn't a prospect or close to being a major league baseball player yet. Um, we went to high school together. Um, we actually met through a mutual friend. Jacob wasn't going to go to prom one year, and uh, my really good friend actually played for the baseball team. And he was like, you know, you should go with Jess. She's a lot of fun. You guys would have a great time. So um, he asked me, and I knew of him because I played softball. So I was like, yeah, of course I'll go, you know, to prom with you. And I always joke now that what I told my mom was at least my prom pictures would be cute, like not knowing that eventually <laughs> we're going to have wedding pictures, you know. So um, right. we went to prom together hit it off his family dynamics is a lot like mine I remember spending our first date we were going to go to the movies before we went to go eat and uh, we talked so much about life and our family and you know we missed the movie we (laughs) completely lost track of time but um, we were instantly clicked um, best friends like right away Um, and then actually we started dating in like April May and then he got drafted in June so um, it was definitely different to go from seeing him every day to all of a sudden he was drafted and you know right after his signs the next day he was off to Florida and he was 17 years old and I was 18 so it was definitely different but um I mean here we are now six almost seven years later and uh getting married and he's a big leaguer now so it's kind of cool to see to have been there from the beginning and see it all come together absolutely absolutely can you can you kind of talk about what it was like to have to be there, I'm sure, when he got the call that he was drafted. What's that moment like? I mean, I've had players, I've had former players on my podcast talk about what the moment was like for them, but I'm interested to hear what that moment was like for you <laughs> being, being somebody that was so close to, you know, being somebody that's, you know, directly relate, you know, direct with the player. Can you kind of talk about that and any conversations he kind of had with you leading up to that about, you know, nerves about being drafted or anything like that? Yeah, of course. Um, So we actually, you know, he was uh, committed to Cal State Fullerton and that was his dream school because growing up he was, you know, he would go to Cal State Fullerton games all the time. So we talked about that and we talked about the draft here and there. And I just would talk to him about, you know, what what team he would want to play for, where he'd want to get drafted and I just remember the day of the draft, he texted me like, hey, can you pick me up and take me to school? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I picked him up, and I remember thinking like, oh, gosh, like I hope nothing happens to him. Like he's he's in my car, like day of draft. Like I don't want to get in the car accident or anything, <laughs> like, you know. And so we get to school, and um, he was already getting a lot of calls from scouts, and it got kind of crazy for him where his phone was ringing so much that he couldn't be in school anymore. So his dad had picked him up. And they actually went to his mom's house and um, set up computers and watched the draft. I was in my um, economics class, and I was really close to the teacher, and he knew the situation. I was like, hey, do you mind if I watch the draft? And he's like, yeah, no problem. So I was watching the time, like the ticker come up and the tracker, and, you know, all of a sudden, 10th round, Jake Freya pops up. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like so excited for him. And I texted him, you know, congrats. That's so amazing. So I wasn't actually with him while it happened but um because since he got picked up 
But um, I did see him the day of, and I was just so happy and thrilled for him because I knew I knew baseball was something that he always wanted to do. Like when he talked about baseball, it was just his life. There was nothing else that he wanted to do in his heart. And um, so I was really thrilled that, you know, it was a first step into his dream coming true. So I was really happy for him, really excited. And, of course, he was thrilled. So it was really cool to actually <laughs> see that, like hear that call versus the call when he that, that he – gave me when he was like hey um get on a plane i'm making my major league debut you know that was, it was just really cool <laughs> right oh we're we're gonna get to that i i, I want to hear that story <laughs> that's I, I bet that's a great story we'll, we'll get to that so yeah you mentioned that uh jacob got drafted uh 2011 major league baseball draft 10th round out of is it gar high school Yep, Gar High School in Cerritos, California. Gar High School in Cerritos, California. So he makes his pro debut with the Gulf Coast Rays. He played in 2012 and 2013 with the Princeton Rays. 2014, yep. Bowling Green. 2015 with Charlotte. Can you talk about, you know, obviously, you know, being being his being his girlfriend at the time and, and <laughs> you know, his long-term girlfriend at the time. Can you talk about, you know, you said, you you mentioned earlier about, you know, the difference between having him there playing high school ball and all that stuff. Once he got drafted, how how did that affect you personally and, um, and your relationship with him? I mean, obviously, you know, you're very supportive and you want, you want him to chase his dream, but can you kind of talk about the adjustment for you personally going from having him there every day to maybe one or two days every couple of weeks or less? Yeah, of course. Uh, it was really different. I think the biggest adjustment was not really knowing what we were going to do. I mean, we were so young, so of course, and I didn't know anybody personally who had um, a significant other in professional baseball. So it wasn't like I could seek advice from anyone being so young. Um, so we kind of took it day by day. And of course there was a three hour time difference from California to Florida. Um, so we kind of had to like get into a routine. So it was like in the Gulf coast league, it was, you know, he was gone in the mornings, and then he would, like, be there in the afternoon. Sometimes there were night games. So, like, it was really weird scheduling. But, like, once we got to, like, Princeton, Bowling Green, Charlotte, Montgomery, it kind of became routine. Like, we knew what baseball um, what baseball season entailed in the sense of I knew that I was going to be busy during this time. I knew he would be busy during this time, and we could, like, talk during this time. So, it was definitely an sure. adjustment not seeing him for so many – I mean – for so long, I guess, like I never knew when I'd see him next. I think that was the biggest, the hardest thing. Like I knew that the way I describe it to girls, because they asked me how I address it or why did I do it? He was my best friend. So whether I was with him physically or not, I'd rather be with him than without him at all, even if I wasn't there with him physically. And I just, I would never come in the way, um, you know, of his dream. That's something that he's always wanted to do. So there was no reason for me to, you know, be there and be like, oh, he didn't talk to me or, oh, he doesn't have time for me. Like, I was just so proud that he was able to have this opportunity to chase his dream because not everybody gets that chance. So um, we just made it work. And that's what we tell people. You just make it work. You make the sacrifices and that's pretty much it. You know, you make compromises for each other and you just support one another. And that's the biggest thing. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. When you, when you found out he got drafted and he started doing all this traveling and everything, you kind of, you kind of touched on it. Um, did you know what you were kind of getting in for from the, from the girlfriend wife standpoint of it? Did you know <laughs> that, that, that this is how it was going to kind of be? absolutely not I think I just, I don't know if I had an idea of like what it would be like or I kind of just hoped that it would be a certain way but I mean it's just you, I think there's no way to prepare yourself other to, than to experience it and then make your own uh, routine out of it uh, there was nothing that I really thought like and I didn't even know what professional baseball entailed like I didn't know there was like seven levels like the, he had to do all this like traveling and he'd be like in the Midwest or in Florida or in the South. Like I had no idea like about any affiliations of the Rays at all when he got drafted. I didn't know what the Montgomery biscuits were, you know. Um, but as time went on, you start to learn. And I learned, I, you know, I tried to learn quick because I wanted to know like what was like what he was getting into. So I wanted to inform myself to, and that way too, like when I talked to him, I knew what was going on. Like I knew, of the organization and I knew of the affiliate affiliates and um, 
pretty much when he was like, when he would say like, okay, I'm going to be here. Like I kind of had an idea of like, okay, so that level's here, you know, just little things like that. But definitely never, uh, I don't even think I had a thought at all or could prepare myself in any way for what this life actually entailed. So. <laughs> right. And you you talked about the double the double A Montgomery team. Now he you know he's had a lot of success in the minor leagues. He was he was ten and one with a one three three ERA, um, and then he got promoted to double A. In his second yep. start with Montgomery, he actually tied a team record with fourteen strikeouts over seven on July fourth. Yeah. On the, okay. <laughs> yep. On the fourth of July. What yeah, was that uh, call? Did he call you after that game and like, oh my God, did you hear what? This is what I did. <laughs> so what's funny is I watched every game. I've never missed a game. Um, I've always made it work to where uh, I was able to either keep track or watch or listen because before Double A, of course, you have to listen to games. So um, sure. I, <laughs> I was actually there for the call <laughs> when he got moved up from high to Double A. So I was actually, I was actually in Port Charlotte when he got moved up to double A. Um, actually, Jake Bowers' parents and his girlfriend were there too because Jake Bowers got moved up with Jacob. So we actually kind of road tripped okay. to Montgomery, which was really cool. So I was there for his first start. And then my grandma was sick at the time, so I flew to Texas, and I watched that 4th of July game with my family. So we had, like, barbecue going. We had the game on. And, like, to the point where, like, I realized what was going on, and I just wouldn't move from my seat because I'm, like, I'm that girl, like, pitcher like if he's in a zone and he's not giving right. up a hit i'm not going to go pee like there's no way so, right. Um, right. but i so, remember he so called me is, and yeah. no go ahead so what you're saying is the players wives are just as superstitious as the players are <laughs> i'm just some girls are i'm just very i'm just as invested i feel like i used to play softball so i know how it is but um sure. i was like there's no way there's times where i'm just like there's no way i'm going up to getting a water or anything like I am I want right. to watch and see what the outcome is and then if I move I'm like oh my gosh is that my fault <laughs> but um, yeah when he sure. called me after that game he was so he was kind of he's just so mellow like he I was like hey like that was amazing great job like how do that and he's just like oh, I just did, like I'm just doing my job like that's how he sees it and it's like that's so amazing to me because I love that he's like that I love that he's like I just went out there and did what I could to put my team in the position to win and that's how he's always been and that's what makes me so proud of him because he's always just so modest and humble and he's never like, yeah, did you see what I did? Like, you know, and it, so it was like just another night, uh, just another night for him. <laughs> so, but that game was definitely really cool. And to have my family watch it with me was like even better. Did they end up winning that game? Um, I, uh, I don't, I don't know. I remember the guy who came in after him gave up a hit and then I don't, rem- I think they did win. Okay. I think it was like four okay. to three, maybe. I just like sometimes I will tell you like it'll be like a blur to me. Like a lot of games this year were such a blur, and I know what happens like mid game, but then I'm like, what was the outcome of that game? Because I think I just get so invested and I lose like my mind during it. <laughs> right. Well, uh, and it's it's totally understandable. I mean, being emotionally invested in it is, you know, that's that's totally understandable. So he he plays for he plays for Montgomery. He pitches. He obviously plays very very well. Uh, he started 2016 with them, and then he gets called up to Durham in June. Mm-hmm. Talk about that. I mean that that's Triple A. That's the closest up to this point that he's been to to his dream of being a major league baseball player. Talk about you know maybe what your mind thought, what he told you, and what kind of what you were thinking about. Like okay, now you know he's he's this is this is really close. This is going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I was actually there for the call from Double A AA to Triple A when he got moved up too. So I did that move with him, and I like try to pick his brain a lot because he's kind of quiet. And I was just like, you know, you're really excited. Like, are you nervous? And he's just, you know, he <laughs> he didn't really say much other than like he knew he knew he can do it. He knows he can do it. And I think once we got the first game out of the way in Durham. Um, he felt more confident because, you know, when you get to a level, you don't know what you're going to expect. You don't know what the hitters are going to be. And, you know, the hitters get more disciplined as you go up. So I think that he, what what 
what helps him is knowing that, hey, my stuff can play here. So after the first game, I remember going out to eat with him, and he just, like, it was kind of like a relief, like, hey, like, look, my stuff can play here, like, all, and I'm right there. And it was actually really cool to drive through Durham because I remember when he got drafted by the Rays, he made me watch Bull Durham. <laughs> so to and then he would explain to me like you know this is okay. a AAA team for the Rays which like at the time like I didn't have like a great idea of um but it was really cool and he, we like drove through Durham and I will say Durham is an amazing baseball city like we love Durham um but yeah he he doesn't really show much nerves ever he's really calm and I think when he's calm it makes me calm so I don't get too too nervous but I think he, once he knew that his stuff played in Durham like he knew that he was you know he was getting close to being ready for that call absolutely so going into last season baseball America had him rated as the number eight best prospect in the race system he obviously you talked about it he started the season with Durham and so talk to me about the day of June 6 2017 what was that like for you? Um, crazy, hectic, and definitely a call I think I can never prepare myself for. <laughs> um, I was actually <laughs> sitting de- uh, The debut was just, it was amazing, I will say. It was really emotional for me um, to sit there. And then, you know, it, I don't know if it hit me per se, but, like, I just remember, I think I was just going through a lot of emotions. We had just gotten engaged two weeks before, um, and then all of a sudden I was sitting there at a big league stadium and, you know, he's making his debut. But when he called me, he called me to like, just talk like any other night. And he asked me what I was doing and I was watching friends. I just, my normal stuff. And he's like, Oh, by the way, like you have to be on a plane to Tampa tomorrow. And I like jumped up and I was like, what? And my sister was on the couch with me and we were screaming and I ran upstairs I was like, and I, my mom was taking a shower, like banged on the bathroom door. And she's like, what's going on? What's wrong? Like she thought like someone got hurt. And I was like, Jacob, he's making his debut. And everyone in the house is just screaming, like just so excited. Um, you know, so we hop on a plane and it was me, my mother, my grandpa, his dad, and, uh, we all fly out, and and then there we are, sitting in a big league stadium, watching him, watching his dream come true. So uh, it was, I really don't have any other words to describe it other than like amazing. It was just, it's a, uh, it, it's a feeling I couldn't even describe to you. Absolutely. So he he obviously got the call to be the starting pitcher the next day, which was June seventh against the White Sox, which also happened to be six years to the day that he was yep. drafted. Yep. So, he that so that's 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 a pretty cool that's a pretty cool thing. 6 years to the day you talked about how he was um went through all the all seven levels of the the race system. So basically one system a year give or take and uh so he playing the White Sox in uh he's playing the White Sox, he makes his major league debut, six and a third innings, three hits, one run, gets the win and snaps the team's four game losing streak. <laughs> yeah. Tell, yeah. Tell me <laughs> I don't tell me I that. really don't have anything to say. <laughs> right. It's still it's still really cool to hear. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Tell me about what seeing him after the game was like. What were you what was going through your head? What what was what how was he tell me tell people about what that was like. Uh, well, I remember after the game, I actually went down on the field, and when I saw him, I, like, ran into his – like, it was like a movie. Like, everything was slow motion, and um, I give him a kiss, and I was like, you know, how are you feeling? How, how, how are you? And he's like, good. Like, I feel great. Like, everything feels good. And I was like, okay, cool. So after, you know, he goes, takes the shower, and then he comes out, and I'm with his family and my family, and we're all asking him, like, how do you feel? Like, that was awesome. And he's like, good. I just feel – like, you know, like I like, I just got there, like – all he ever wanted was an opportunity and like to, you know, to have a chance to show that the Rays what he could do. So he just, wanted, you know, to have that and he got it and he did so well. So uh, he was just, he was really happy. And I don't know, like he, like I say, he's just so mild mannered. He was kind of like, like, yeah, that was really cool. And, and that was it. Like he didn't really, I think he was in shock. I think we were all in shock. And he, so he couldn't say more than it was really cool. And that was really awesome. And, and I remember sitting with him that night, and I was like, did that really just happen? And he's like, yeah, that happened, you know? It was just like, I think it was more like a pinch yourself type moment. And um, sure. But it was really cool because his agents were there as well. And then after, we all went to dinner, and 
we all got to spend a nice dinner with him and all, you know, all our loved ones and just to have everyone there. It was just really cool to experience it with us. Absolutely. And just, it sounds like he, it sounds like him and you both really just kind of got to take in that moment. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. I think, and then we knew it was a spot start. So we knew it was just one day um, and it was like the best day ever, (laughs) but it was, uh, it was really cool to just kind of, embrace it and just have everyone there and I was just really proud I guess like, I, I don't really don't have any other words to say it was just like it was so cool to sit there and just watch him like on a daily basis like I do you know I watch every game and I watch him and I see different things that I will say like this was definitely um different than and better than all the rest <laughs> absolutely absolutely much more special when it's, when it's the first one but it, it was the first one, but it wouldn't be the only one. Uh, Jacob, yeah. after Jacob last season, also became the ninth pitcher in history to start his career with seven or more quality starts. Yeah, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. Can you, now that you've kind of had a little bit of time to become, I guess, a baseball fiance, a baseball wife, whatever. Can you kind of talk about what what the other baseball wives and the other wives on the team are like and how, how that camaraderie kind of works? Because that's a pretty exclusive, um, for lack of a better term, fraternity that you're in because there's only a certain mm-hmm. amount of women on the planet that know what that's like. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah I, as soon as I got uh, – Jacob got called up and I was um, in the big league stadium and I was around the – woman more um they were so welcoming i had anna boxberger who kind of became my mentor um come up to me the day of jacob was um the first day jacob was there and congratulate me and give me a big hug and um and then there was people like ashley borges who jacob and i used to watch pete play with the angels because we grew up you know minutes away from angel stadium so it was really cool for me to say like you know hey um, Pete's kind of awesome and Jacob and I loved watching him in high school but <laughs> these women are amazing it's really great to have yeah. a group of girls who know exactly what you're going through and know exactly what this life is like like you know and you can go to them for different things but they're all so supportive and so sweet and it's really become like a part of your family you know they they become Absolutely. more invested they could become just as invested in your significant other you know than they are in theirs because you know we're all in this together like at the end of the day we are all a team. And so it's really cool to hang out and be with these girls on a daily basis and just be able to confide in them and just know that you have friends who have your back. And um, that's what I like about it. None of the girls here have ever showed any, you know, cattiness or, you know, but they become like such a strong, like really there's like a huge wag, like community where, you know, like a huge Instagram where, you know, a lot of the wives follow and they become really good friends. And like, I have friends with like the Cubs and the Rangers and different teams. And it's just, it's just a really cool group of women who um, are so strong and supportive and just amazing. And that's, and you know, honestly, that's what we need more of. We need, we need, you know, we need as many women to be as proud and as strong and as supportive, not only to each other, but, to their husbands and to fans and everything. We just, we need more of that. So I think, yeah, I absolutely. think that's awesome. Can you, I agree. okay. So, you know, you, you talked about, you know, his minor league career and his major league debut. Let's talk a little bit about Ray's fan fest. Cause I follow, I follow you, I follow both of you guys on Twitter and he just got done with Ray's fan fest and he didn't look like he had any fun at all. He wasn't posting Ton of photos a day, and he, he didn't look like he had anything at all. Can you can you kind of talk about what uh, Ray's fan fest? Yeah, we actually this was our second fan fest. So we went in uh, 2016 when he made the roster. We didn't go in 2017. We weren't able to go, but we came back this year, and it's just awesome. I really enjoy the opportunity to meet the fans and get to know them because at the end of the day, you know, they're the ones supporting Jacob as much as I support him. You know, so it's really cool to get to know these people, to create relationships with them. There's a couple of fans that I've known since Jacob was in, you know, GCL and Princeton that have become good friends. And, you know, they're always just so supportive and sweet. And Rays fans, honestly, are, they're just, they're the greatest. I, you know, when we're out in St. Pete, nobody really bothers us. And like when we're eating and, you know, after the fact, like after we're eating, they'll come up to us. But nobody ever like is in our face or rude or, you know, just like they're always um, very respectful. And that's what I really like about the Rays fans and, 
and St. Pete and um, but FanFest is awesome. It's always good to get out there and to get to mingle with the fans and talk to them. And I really enjoy, um, like, even on Twitter, like, when the fans tweet me, like, I enjoy talking to them. Like, they're great. So, um, but we had fun at FanFest, and it was cool to meet a new group of fans. And I guess especially after him having a season or somewhat of a season under his belt as a big leaguer to see, you know, the other fans and how they reacted to him coming up and how, um, how they felt about him as, you know, being in the rotation and things like that. So it was really cool to um, hear, you know, what they, how they feel about him and how excited they are for the upcoming season. Absolutely. And and for fans who, who aren't familiar, I should know the, the wives' names that you mentioned earlier. Those are the wives of Peter Burroughs and Brad Boxberger. Um, Brad Boxberger and so, Peter Borges, yeah. Peter Borges, yeah. So we got about we got about three minutes left here. Can you can have you been asked to sign any autographs? Is anybody like, oh, you're Jessica, you're you're Because you know there's fans, <laughs> that, you know, and I can tell you this as a collector, there are fans. I'm I'm not this kind of collector, but there are fans who will who will you know they'll ask players' wives to sign if it gets them that closer to the player. Have you been asked to sign any autographs? Um, I've assigned two balls, and I will tell you, it's not as easy as the guys make it look. <laughs> it is actually really challenging to um, sign a ball. But, yeah, I find, like, a couple of balls, but nothing crazy. I mean, the fans are – but, I mean, it's it's just weird, like, because I – even when I see Jacob sign autographs, I'm like, I'm like, that's just Jacob. Like, that's not – you know, that's nobody, like – super famous like that's just my fiance you know so it's, it's even weird for me to like when people are like hey jake can you sign her like when there's a crowd around him i'm like okay cool you know so it's just something sure. different i guess but just a couple of balls absolutely. nothing crazy not, but yeah absolutely so we got about three minutes left here give me the tell me maybe the top three things that you are looking most forward to for the 2018 season either for yourself or for jake um for Jacob just to have a healthy a healthy season um I th- I'm really excited to see the Rays and all the young guys coming up it's definitely going to be a different looking team and I feel like as young as they are they're really hungry and I'm looking forward to seeing them compete against teams you know in the AL East like <laughs> the Yankees and the, and the Red Sox and the Orioles and the Blue Jays and um and the, what I really like to do during the season is just spend time with Jacob and, and experience different things like traveling with him and uh, seeing different cities. So my goal is to see every stadium. So I'm on that journey right now, and I've seen a good amount. But I'm um, just looking forward to another healthy uh, and successful season. Absolutely, absolutely. Jessica, we're just about out of time here. I'm going to let you go. But uh, I cannot thank you enough for giving for giving me half an hour out of your night. I would love to have yeah, Jacob on sometime. It was a it was it was my pleasure to have you guys on. It's great to hear kind of great to hear a different aspect. Um it's nice to hear the aspect of a player's wife and uh to kind of hear that side of the story. I'd love to have Jacob on. Best of luck to you guys both personally and to you guys professionally and uh, I appreciate you ha- I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much, dear. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. All right, thanks. All right, bye. All right, that that was Jessica Soto. She is the she is the wife or fiance, I guess, of of the of the Tampa Bay Rays pitcher Jacob Faria. Very, very, very cool um, to get that point of view. You don't often get that point of view, especially from you know from from somebody who's somebody who's living it right now you you know they the women sacrifice a lot they sacrifice a lot of time for their husband's dreams and for for their fiance's dreams or whatever the case may be so it it's so nice to hear the love and enthusiasm that she has in her voice for Jacob and i uh I'm a I'm a diehard Twins fan, but I will tell you that I'm I'm a fan of Jacob now too, and I think I think we all are. So we're we're gonna wrap up here. We have Phil Mackey coming on, ESPN fifteen hundred. Phil Mackey coming on shortly, and we will get that going. 